Scott, a podcast devoted to listening to the personal stories of living economists and helping build an oral history of the last 50 years of the profession. I'm Scott Cunningham, the host, a professor of economics at Baylor University. And today I'm excited to introduce to you Ashesh Rambakan, an assistant professor of economics at MIT. Ashesh's research spans causal inference, which for those of you that are longtime listeners know that I have a special interest in bringing on guests that make contributions to that area. His research spans that area of causal inference, but it also includes work that you don't usually associate with causal inference, uh, which is mean machine learning predictive algorithms. So a lot of you are probably familiar with Ashish's work uh, on difference and differences with John Roth in their paper uh, recently published in the Review of Economic Studies, A More Credible Approach to Parallel Trends. But I bet many of you that are very interested with that, interested in and know about that paper, may not know about his work on algorithmic fairness. Sorry, I got my, I'm um, getting all garbled here. So <clears throat> uh, that's what we're gonna do a lot of our talking about today. So uh, I wanna turn it over to them. I'm not gonna take up much more of your time, but uh, thanks so much for tuning in and I uh, hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Okay, well, it is a pleasure to have with me on the show a uh, person I've actually not had a chance to talk to before. I think maybe we've emailed maybe before, but uh, yeah. but but we've never really spoken before. Uh, for the sake of the listener, can you introduce yourself? Tell us your your name, your full title, and who pays your bills? Yeah, so uh, my name is Ashesh Rambachan, um, and I'm an assistant professor in the economics department at MIT. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks for being on the show, Ashesh. On the show, Ashesh. Uh, let's let me start with uh, an icebreaker. Um, what's a vacation that you took, have taken in your life before? Uh, it's not your favorite. It doesn't have to be your favorite. It doesn't have to be your least favorite. But you've noticed that it, it's popped into your mind uh, every now and then. Oh, that's a that's a fun question. Um... I guess, yeah, it's a, a vacation I always, I think about often was, uh, so I grew up, I grew up in Minnesota. So every time the summer rolls around, uh, my family would always do like a weekend trip to the Wisconsin Dells, oh. which is indoor water park city for, for those who, who know the Midwest. And so for whatever reason, whenever the summer rolls around, I'm always thinking about when am I going the family trip to the Wisconsin Dells, which is a very, it's a very oddly magical place. So would highly recommend if everyone's grew in Wisconsin. Are you going to do it this summer? No, I so this is why I think it's just nostalgia for uh for my childhood because I haven't actually gone back since like high school. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, but it's a lot of yeah, a lot of fond memories. And oh. it's a it's a genuinely an absurd place why there are like 10 different water parks in the middle of rural Wisconsin. Oh, that's crazy. And they're like top top yeah. water parks. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, wow. Okay. I never I I that's awesome. So uh, yeah, that's great. Well, okay. Well, so tell me, where did you grow up? You said you grew up in, in Minnesota. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Where in Minnesota there. was it? Um, so I grew up in a, in a suburb of Minneapolis, uh, called Apple Valley. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How, how big is Apple Valley? Uh, it's about like 40 or to 50,000 people or so. It's like 30 or 40 minutes outside of the, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, so not like quite a small town, but not like a super big suburb. Mm, okay. Okay. What'd your parents do for a living? Uh, so my mom, uh, it, well, I guess she was, she's now retired, um, was a family physician. Um, and then my dad, uh, he was actually also a professor, um, but he was a professor in a religion department at a sort of small liberal arts college in Minnesota. Oh, so wow. He, yeah. So he did research in and then taught, uh, sort of broadly about sort of South Asian Indian religions, um, oh. but really focused on Hinduism. Oh, interesting. Ah, what kind of stuff was his research topics about? Did you, was it stuff you would, could, could explain? Yeah. So kind of broadly at the, um, so he's done a lot of work on like interreligious like dialogue. So trying to mm. compare, sort of like interacting with, uh, you know, folks of different religions, um, thinking about what are sort of common themes across across religions. Then a little more recently, uh, there's like 
a strand within Christianity called like liberation theology. Which yeah. I think about how Christianity can be used to argue for, you know, progressive ideas. And so he's uh -huh. been thinking about what that, what does that look like in, in Hinduism as well? Oh, there might be a version of that in Hinduism. Yeah. Oh, does it? Okay. All right. That's cool. So do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have two, two older siblings, uh, one older brother and an older sister. Oh, okay. So they were all, it was all three of you guys go into the water park in the summer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they weren't so much older that they didn't go. No, so they, uh, so my sister, she's uh, eight years older than me. So there's quite a big age difference between us yeah. and my brother four years. But as I was saying, the the Wisconsin Dells, you know, has has fun for people of all sizes. So <laughs> they what's would all the come scariest, on. what's the scariest rod at the water park there in the, in the Dells that you've ever been on or seen, or that might even be too scary? <laughs> I, well, there was one when I was a kid that I was really scared of. It was like this, uh, have you ever seen like those like drop slides yeah. where you just kind of stand on a platform and then it just opens up underneath you and you shoot oh down. So there's a, there's a couple of those and I was always terrified of it. Yeah. That's, that sounds terrible. Uh, okay. So, so what about, so in, uh, what about when you were back in Apple Valley? Like what could I have found you doing on a Saturday when you were like middle school? So in middle school, uh, on a Saturday, I was, so I was probably just hanging out, hanging around at home. So I did play like up until the end of middle school, I played a lot of like random little league like sports. So I did like soccer, a lot of baseball. Um, and then uh, it, starting like sort of the end of middle school, there's like, uh, there's like a version of it in middle school and then it's like a big activity in high school, like mm -hmm. around speech. So I was like on the middle school speech team and they'd be these like little competitions on like Saturday mornings. Um, so kind of, yeah, mostly probably splitting my time between that mm -hmm. random little league sports and then, I don't know, just hanging, just hanging around in my, my neighborhood. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. And so when you were like in middle school, did you, did you have anything that you ever said to yourself, you know, this is what I want to be when I grow up? Yeah, I guess I'd probably, uh, I don't, I think I'd always, I'd always sort of thought about doing, doing something in academia is the wrong word, but I guess since I've, I've proved, I am very close to my, my parents in particular, my dad. And so I'd always just sort of seen him as a professor so i think i'd always maybe i'd always sort of thought of that as an option mm -hmm. um, but it was either it was kind of either that or default into you know some version of like doctor lawyer engineer mm -hmm. vague mess um, yeah. but i don't think ever i don't think when i was young i really had like a very this is a 100 the profession i wanted to do yeah yeah yeah, yeah. right Right. That kind of vague professionalism of life. But although having that professor as a dad, that, that probably added something that a lot of your friends didn't necessarily have even that. Oh, idea. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't think, I mean, I think because of him, I knew like, oh, there's actually a career you could have yeah. sort of being in academic, being an academic, doing research, whatever that actually is. It is something that people actually do in the world, which right. um, if he was not, if that, if I didn't have that in my life, I don't really know where, how I would have gotten exposed to it until I went to like college. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So you go to Apple Valley's high school. How big is that high school? Yeah, so, uh, so there are two high schools in Apple Valley, the Apple Valley High School and then Eastview High School. So I went to Eastview High School um, and that was like maybe like 2000 students total, like mm -hmm. about 500 or so in a year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, not not crazy large, but definitely like a pretty decent size high school. Yeah, yeah, large enough where you you walk down the hall and you're like, I've never seen some of these people before in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> How is that possible? We're here every day. That's right. We're we're here every day, and we somehow all live in like a three square mile radius. <laughs> and you're <laughs> a complete stranger. How have I never laid eyes on you before? Uh, yeah, right. So, what kind of classes were you sort? Of, I mean, I know you probably well. Was the was everything pretty much wired for you? You had to take these classes, or do you have a lot of discretion over what you chose? 
No, it's pretty, it's pretty set. Uh, you like, you show up your first year and then there's a pretty clear set of everyone takes like an honor, like a government class. Everyone takes like an English class, the sort of main and science or the science classes are pretty standardized as well. Sort of main differentiation uh, in my high school was you could either opt into like an honors math track or like a regular math track, which in retrospect are like horrible names for like tell kids like you're either a regular kid or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Uh, and so then if you took like the honors math track in big air quotes, you would start with, I guess it was like algebra two, which I have still have no idea what the numbers associated with algebra for me. And Right. if you were in the regular math track, you would start with like algebra or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So which one were you in? You're in the, you're in the, Uh, the, the honor. yeah, Group. so I was in, so I started with, uh, with algebra two. And Uh-huh. so then that meant if you were in that track, you could take, uh, like AP calculus by the time you graduate. Could you see that coming all the way in middle school that you were like, yeah, I'm pretty good at mathematics. That was something you always sort of had a feel for. Uh, is something I always enjoyed it. I mean, hilar like hilariously, I, uh, was very, I was not in the, uh, honors track in middle school. Um, basically there's the way the district worked was you had to, if I remember correctly, you had to take some standardized test at the end of like fourth grade and that determined whether you got placed into the honors track in fifth grade. And then that was the track you were in through middle school. Yeah. Uh And then there like another standardized exam at the end of middle school that would determine where you went plus some teacher discretion where you went in high school. -huh. Uh, and I was, let's say not a very, uh, good student at like sitting quietly for, <laughs> for Yeah. a test. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I remember I did, I remember I did really badly on whatever test determined the regular versus honors classes going into middle school. And mom was, uh, not happy <laughs> with me about it. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> but you still, it, but it's funny though, you, your dad, he, he goes into this religion track and you're sort of, and you, and you felt this real connection with him, but like, you're clearly kind of being drawn into this more STEMish Yeah. sort of, you've got these STEM talents. Was anybody in your family surprised to, to, that that would be the case that, I mean, that you, you would have this career kind of as a, uh, you know, someone who's very technical. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if anyone, I guess since my, since my mom was, uh, was a doctor, I like, Yeah. she did a, you know, a lot of like STEM work in college and then went Right. to medical school. Yeah. Um, And so, like, I think she was a very big, like, driver in the sense that, like, math and science is important um, and, and valued that. And then uh, my dad was just more, more than anything else, like, wanted us to be, like, intellectually curious people. Uh, and so I think the, the combination of those two, I guess, is what... push probably all three of me, me and my siblings into like really caring about, you know, schoolwork. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then I think probably the, the math and science part comes a lot from, from like my mom. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. 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 Right. When you said doctor, I, I, for some reason got law, got captivated by your dad's uh, religion focus. Well, so, um, so when you were graduating high school, when you were about to graduate, uh, what, what if I could have like eavesdropped on your teachers, like in the faculty lounge, you know, and just said, and they were talking about you, you know, what to the outside, to your teachers, do you know, what do you think they saw about you? That was like, did they would, what do you think they would have said about the kind of, kids you were and where you were going. Um, so I think, so certainly by, by the end of high school, I, I really was very excited about kind of anything in, for lack of a better word, like the space of public policy. So I did a lot of, um, sort of the main activity I did in, in high school was like debates and then a particular, uh, 
type of speech called like extemp speaking mm. where you would get like you would be given some question about like current events and then have like 30 minutes to uh come up with your answer and then present it for like oh. six or seven minutes yeah um, and I, just, I really loved it um and loved like just the chance to think about current events and like mm. Paul's problems who knows what i said if anything is actually reasonable yeah uh, but so coming out so that as because of that experience coming out of high school i like really knew i was interested in that space um so i think like i think a lot of my that was very clear to my teachers as well yeah and so I think if, I think if you heard that, I think they would have forecast, I would continue in that direction. Yeah. But I think given like what my high school was like, um, like he had like an AP econ class, um, which was really great, but there wasn't much exposure to the fact that you can take ideas from like science and math and use them to think rigorously about sort of policy questions that mm. kind of me when I... Um, was an undergrad. So mm. I think my teachers would be sort of unsurprised that I ended up in economics, but maybe surprised like what that work in economics actually looks right, like. Right, right, right. Oh, that's interesting. So speech and debate, I was almost conflating them. This wasn't debate. This was, you were giving public speaking. Yeah, that's right. And that's you were right. speaking about, and it would be like, you would randomly draw a policy question like climate change and you'd have 30 minutes to prep. Yeah. Yeah. So you would, uh, so the way you would work is you would be allowed to like bring with you before, before we like had laptops in our debate, our speech and debate team, you would be allowed to bring these like plastic filing tubs oh. where you could print newspaper articles, cut them up and then like organize them by topic. Yeah. And, and so you would like draw a question, I don't know, like this was what, like 2010, 2011. So something about monetary policy, who knows? Right. And then you go to your little tub, you have like a folder, like yep. oh, here's all the New York Times articles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About that recently. Right, 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 right. Was it Did a lot of economics? It? Was it a lot of, I mean, if it's public policy, it is going to get into a lot of econ. Yeah. So there's a, there's a good amount of like economics questions, um, and then a lot of like internet questions about like international affairs. Oh. Um, so huh. yeah, like I was in high school. Um, I think like one of the, the big topics was like the Arab spring it started in like 2011. So there's a mm. lot of questions about like, you know, what's going to happen in Egypt, what's going to happen in Tunisia, things of that, not yeah. exactly, that, but things of that form. And right. so you're like, foreign affairs articles, then you'd have like a 16 year old going yeah. in from some, you know, mom from Minnesota to start yeah. to about the future of the, of democracy in the Middle East. <laughs> right, kind, right. Of, kind of an absurd premise, but it was like, it was very eye opening to just get the chance to like learn about a ton of stuff that you wouldn't actually like encounter in, at least in the high school classes that I had. Yeah, 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 sure. Were you, um, was your interest in public policy even there before you started this, the speech class, the speech club or what is it? How would you describe this class? It's a class. Uh, it was like an extracurricular act is like an extracurricular yeah, yeah. activity that you would like said, so you know, most days after school go like meet with, meet with my team, read, mm. let's talk with them about um, these sorts of topics. Um, and yeah, I, I think, I think that's right. I think I'd always, I guess it was a combination of things like one I was always interested in I had always like an interest in definitely like the international affairs aspect of it both like both my parents were like immigrants to the U.S. but they were originally from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean lived in the UK for a while then immigrated to the U.S. so like mm -hmm. they were always very paid attention to this news in the US, but particularly paid attention to like global news more generally. Uh -huh. uh, and so I think like from them, I was always sort of exposed to this is something important. Mm. Uh, and then also like, I really love sports, but I wasn't very good at anything. Uh -huh. So by the time high school came around, there's no way I was actually going to be on a, on right, a team. Right, right, right. I kind of needed some, some extracurricular activity to not yeah. drive my insane. Right, 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 right. 
So, uh, so when you are graduating high school, do you now have a little bit more of, has your, like, what you want to be when you grow up, is it starting to take a little bit more shape than it had, like, five years earlier? Yeah, yeah. So I think if you like, I think if you put truth serum in high school graduating me, I think I thought I would have wanted to like go work somewhere in Washington, D.C., whether that was like at a think tank Mm -hmm. or at, as like an aide in some like department of the federal government. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so when I started college, I th- I think I was, if I remember correctly, I was somehow, I was somewhere between like majoring in economics or majoring in like political science or or politics. That's the department of Princeton. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you, so you're definitely wanting a major though, when you're graduating high school, you're thinking of a major that will allow you to continue being more focused on public policy. Right. Right. So you're, you're, you're good. It's, am I right? You're, you're, you're clearly good at mathematics, but you're, you're thinking about policy as a more of a form, more of how you want to spend your time at Princeton. Yeah, that's right. So I, I'd say like, yeah, in high school, I like really loved all the math classes I took, did like AP Calc. I was like, the, we, I was part of, there was like a first trial run where they, taught like multivariate they had like the opportunity to like take multivariable calculus as a senior and so I like took that really liked it but it was always to me just like before I got before I started taking econ classes in college I was just sort of oh math is fun I don't really know how it intersects with these sort of other bigger picture policy questions that I was interested in Mm. it's kind of just more like an intellectual curiosity on the side so how quickly do you have to declare a major when you end up at Princeton? Is it like immediately you start thinking of econ? Um, I think you had to offic- you had to officially declare at the end of your sophomore year. Okay. Uh, and so then in like your my your first year, you, there's like some general education classes that everyone has to take, mm-hmm. um, but they're pretty flexible. Um, and so when I got there, um, I was like, well if I'm choosing between economics or political science, I already done take, I did AP econ in high school. So it's like, okay, well maybe I'll, I'll skip the intro econ class. Let me take like the intermediate micro and macro classes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I did that uh, during my freshman year. And like those two classes together were like super, very eye opening experiences. Cause uh, you know, actually using, you know, the language of calculus to talk about how people make choices and think about like economic growth. Um, So it was really the first, those two classes together, the first time that I saw, oh, these like two seemingly very distinct interests really intersected in a, in a potentially very like useful and impactful way. Do you remember who taught those two intermediate classes? Was it a professor or a T or a TA? Yeah, so uh, the micro class uh, was taught by uh, Marco Battaglini, uh-huh. who I think, I think he's now uh, at Cornell. Uh, and then the macro class was taught by Greg Kaplan. Oh, okay, okay. So, so you, so do you take any econometrics while you're? What do you, what is your reaction when you get into the econometrics class? Yeah, so then, so I did those in my first year, and then in my second year, I did the, so I guess in, so then I started taking, um, I never really done stats before, so I remember I took, like, this intro stats class uh, in my freshman year in the, it's like in the operations research department, Mm -hmm. which is like probability and stats, you know, intro class for engineers, uh, and I remember that was uh, the class where I, I legitimately failed the midterm. Oh, yeah. I got like 30 out of 100 on the midterm. I was that was like the first time in my life I had ever actually like <laughs> failed the exam. Uh, but the professor uh, was amazing. He's actually he's this guy named Sebastian Bubeck, who has now gone on to like do really like his keys to do a ton of stuff on like banded algorithms and now is like the LLM guy at Microsoft research. So it's like, Oh, wow. He's kind of like an amazing, he's like an amazing trajectory. Uh, but he was taught, taught me intro stats. Um, and so I took that and it, 
like eventually recovered in the class. Um, and like, again, really, that was again, a case where it's like, oh, this is kind of like fun math balls and urns probability. I don't really quite Yeah. see where it's useful. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I took in my sophomore year, like the intermediate econometrics class, Mm. uh, I was, you know, taught like out of the stock and Watson textbook. And that was very, it felt a very similar experience as like the micro macro where it's like, wow, I didn't realize like both linear algebra and this like kind of random probability facts can be really helpful in answering interesting questions about the world. Mm, mm, mm. So you, which professors of the faculty do you remember that made a big impression on you, you know, while you were at Princeton or that you were like maybe looked up to or they had a big impression on you? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of a lot of them. So, um, so I definitely so the two people I ended up being the closest to by the time I was like graduating. Um, so at Princeton, you have to you have to both you have to write what's called like a junior paper and Mm then senior thesis. Um, so and when you're doing that, you have like a advisor on the faculty who you're sort of supposed to like meet with. uh every every now and then to basically make sure you're actually writing something -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and so the advisor for my junior paper was um this labor economist uh, Hank Farber Yeah. Yeah. I interviewed him, uh, on Friday. uh, oh amazing um so yeah Hank he was he was just yeah he was awesome I went to go meet with it like I remember going to his office back when they were like the industrial relations section was in like the basement of the library. Yeah. Uh, and he was just, he was someone who was just like so enthusiastic about learning about the world. Yeah. Um, like I remember, I remember there was one time he, I was like going to visit his office and I think it was like some new ver some new CPS month had dropped Uh-huh. like on his computer, just like calculating summary stats. <laughs> right, And then right. like Orly Ashenfelter is down the hall and Hank is like yelling statistics to Orly about, you know, a month of the CPS. And that was just like, it was super inspirational to see someone like both of his stature and like so far along in his career, still just like so enthusiastic about like learning from data and Yeah. caring about worlds. Uh, so he was someone who's like immensely, uh, immensely like influential for me Yeah. Mm and that, um the person who advised my senior th thesis uh is this time series econometrician uh mark watson hmm. Mm. uh, and that i gotten to know him from like an econometrics class i had taken Mm. and he was he was like very early on very just encouraging of what i was interested in so i had somehow ended up taking like a class on machine learning so i was like talking Oh, this machine learning stuff sounds interesting. Um, and he like very quickly is like, oh, that's, that could be really, that could be like really important. You should maybe think about, uh, is there something you could do with your senior thesis on it? Mm. Mm. Uh, and the fact that like, again, someone of his stature and stage in his career was both like happy to talk to me and then also like very supportive was, it's the sort of thing like, it's amazing how much that sticks with you and how Yeah. like that, that Yeah. has on like, you yourself and like a broader community. So what do you do your thesis on? So I did my thesis on, uh, so I basically pulled a bunch of like macro time series from Fred, from Fred. Um, and then was asking how basically just trying to see how well could you do like one quarter ahead two quarter head, three quarter head, like forecasts Yep. using various uh, like sort of machine learning algorithms off the shelf. Yeah. And then always kind of trying to compare, compare back to like simple AR models, simple, Mm-hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what is, what exactly is the sort of, uh, you know, off the shelf uh, power of these, these prediction, the new prediction tools. Yeah. So were you pretty excited by prediction and that by the time you were doing that thesis or was that something that was kind of exciting you like for the first time? Yeah, it, so I'd say it, 
I started getting, I got interested in it during like, um, yeah, during like my junior year of college, um, where, uh, I taken, uh, I took like some computer science class and like a class in optimization, but this was like 2015, 2016. And so there was these sort of big, um, big like breakthroughs on ImageNet, image classification. Um, and so just people were very, people around Princeton in like the math and CS world were really excited about uh, the potential of, of these algorithms. Um, and so that is what sparked it. And then I think Mark really encouraged me to like, oh, you should, you should explore this a bit more. Mm. Mm. Who knows where this, who knows where this could go in economics. Mm. 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 So you're not just doing, I mean, you are, you're saying that thesis is doing off the shelf things, but you're interacting a lot with these computer science and stats people. Yes. And you're sort of knowing that there's a lot more there. There's a lot more than just the kind of stuff you're working on in this thesis that's, that's emerging yeah. right now. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so was it, how quickly is it at Princeton that you realize I'm going to want to do a PhD in economics? Uh, that's a, I think that that's a good question. Uh, I think that probably, I think I started, I think I, it entered into the option sets, um, maybe sometime, uh, in my junior year, I would say, mm. um, where I think through these, through interacting with, with Hank, I think he was, he was very supportive of what I was working on in, in my mm. junior paper and then suggesting like, you know, you should, you should think about if you enjoyed this, like you should think about doing a, doing a PhD. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I had, I was still like a little unsure about, you know, what, what is like this, what is the path of a PhD look like? So mm -hmm. I remember the like key decision point for me was all of my friends, uh, you know, would do summer internships in fine in various types of finance. So I was like, oh, maybe I should should try this, yeah. see what it's like to have a real job. Um, so did a summer internship um working at a at a job in finance after my junior year. Mm. And it was really fun. Uh, but I sort of I both missed the like freedom to just sort of explore on your own. Um and also I really, I really suffered from having a boss tell me that I had to show up yeah. by like eight people right. and if I left before right. 7 p.m. Yeah. Uh, and so it was Hank's encouragement trying that out that then when I came back in my senior year, I was like, well, might as well apply for a PhD, see what happens. And then Got it. Got it. Well, what was that first year like at Harvard? What was your expectations and what was it like? Yeah, it was, um, I guess my, my expectations going in were that it would be sort of, it would be like the first, not the first time, but, you know, just like a chance to really do nothing else, but sort of think about, uh, think about economics, um, yeah. and like, and do that surrounded by other people in my cohort who were doing exactly the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, and that was, yeah, that was really the case. It was the first year was just, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think what was nice was very clearly early on, um, sort of the department at Harvard, they made it very clear, like classes are important, but don't, you know, really stress out about getting grades. The point is not you're in competition with your friends. The point is you guys should be working together to like, help each other learn. Mm. Um, and so I think, I think that at least for, for me and for like my close circle of friends, I think that created like a really, I was really fortunate that I was in an environment where, you know, people weren't trying to compete with each other. Mm. Um, I was very supportive. Um, and then I think I was also, I was also really lucky uh, that I just got to meet faculty who were, you know, 
more than happy to waste time answering my yeah my random questions um so quickly during the fall of my first year gary chamberlain taught the sort of first semester of econometrics yeah um, he was like just so so generous with his time mm. in the classes and whenever i came to his office to ask him about you know something related to class he would always be he'd always want to know like what else were we interested in and what were we thinking about mm. um and that was i again it was just another is another example of like someone who's very senior being really generous and with a young person mm -hmm. and that's really uh really inspirational. Um, and then I also got the chance to get to know, um, send him line then yeah. pretty early this year. And he was somebody very similar, just really, really kind, really willing to spend time with someone who doesn't really know what they're, they're doing. Um, yeah. and I think both of those made both of those plus my cohort and friends like made the first year, like a really, uh, fun and exciting time of like classes getting to start think about think about questions um, yeah 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 so who what's your first co-authored project while you're a phd student do you remember yeah so i think the first uh so the first one was um i guess it might have it probably was uh this like papers and proceedings um paper with with sendel um mm. Dennis Ludwig and John Kleinberg on, on algorithmic fairness. Mm. Um, so I think that, yeah, that must've been in like the late fall, early spring of my first year. How'd that come uh, about? Uh, so that, how did that come about? Um, so I remember, yeah, I think what, I think if I remember right, um, so I'd, I'd gotten, I'd reached out to, to Sendel, sending him some email like, oh, I'm first year, I'm a first year student. I was really interested in machine learning as an undergrad. Now I'm in the economics department. Uh, it'd be great to, it'd be great to talk. Um, and so he like said, yeah, we'll meet. Um, and what the thing he wanted to, to structure meetings around was like, what random thoughts have I had in the mm. last, like, if it's just something, you know, it's just like a couple of sentences. Oh, I read this newspaper article. It's kind of interesting stuff like that. And I think if, if I remember right, I had, I was, I think it came out, it might, it, this might've emerged from some conversation with Gary. Um, but I was talking to, I think it might've been Gary. I was talking to him about like statistical discrimination. Mm like sort of the model of statistical discrimination is people are forming predictions about some outcome and those predictions are different across groups. And that's mm. what leads to uh, disparate treatment. Right. Uh, and so I remember, I think I sent Sendel an email like, oh, something like statistical discrimination seems related to like prediction as we would talk about in machine right. learning. Right, right. People statistically discriminate can like algorithms also statistically discriminate. Oh yeah. Um, and then I think his response was like, oh, well, if you find that interesting, there's like, you know, entire conferences and fields within computer science, like trying to think hard about this question. Yeah. Uh, like we should, we should chat more about it. Um, mm. And so I, the papers and proceedings was they were talking about these ideas Um and I just, I just kind of showed up at the right time to, uh, to also think about it with them. Hmm. Hmm. So fairness, algorithmic fairness, you can't really understand. It's a, a one way to understand it is to think about it in terms of statistical discrimination also happening with these algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's right. I think, you know, it's one way to think, the way I think about it is, you know, when we, when we write down a sort of supervised learning oh uh, yeah right algorithm, we write down some objective function and some data yeah and we're effectively writing down a procedure to optimize that objective function given the data that we have right so all of our classic models in economics have that same structure 
Um, mm. And so understanding when our algorithm behaves differently across groups, um, there are analogs of that, of course, in the literature exists a ton of work on discrimination. And mm. I think a lot, of, a lot of work in algorithmic fairness, if you come at it from economics, can kind of be traced back to pointing out, you know, this is a parallel of statistical discrimination as labor economists talk about it. This is what it looks like when an algorithm does it. Um, but what's really interesting is that, you know, the choices made by people are black boxes. You never really know what's going on inside a person's Totally. Head. Yeah. Right. Write down and make precise what a supervised learning algorithm, what its objective function is, what data is it, to, is it using, what function yeah. class is it using. Um, and perhaps we can then design them in ways to prevent that sort of disparate. It's behavior. very normative. It seems, you know, I usually think of machine learning as very positive. You know, it's like uh, make a prediction, but you, you're bringing these normative questions into it by bringing yeah, up absolutely. disparate treatment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think what's one thing that was really uh, sort of striking to me early on in my PhD was how a lot of the questions that computer scientists were working on, you know, really had started to look like questions that economists had spent a long time thinking about. And we have a lot of, um, you know, skills and ideas to bring to the table, mm. you know, if you're, as supervised learning algorithms now play a role in deciding who gets interviewed for a job, who gets right. hired for a job, yep. what, what defendants should be recommended for release or detention. Mm. Uh, you know, those are canonically economic settings where we understand, we use economics to understand the data generating process. Yeah. All machine learning is, is summarizing features of those that data generating process. Mm -hmm. So we use ideas from economics to understand when, when, when these algorithms may work well, when they may perform poorly, um, mm. and how we can fix that. Hmm. I usually think, you know, since I don't come from a machine learning background, I always just sort of, you know, imagine, well, in prediction, we're just trying to, you know, minimize some weighted average of these false positives and false negatives. But I haven't really thought, it's like, I guess I had just sort of thought the machine learning algorithm was always going to be discriminating. Like it was always going to be taking groups and then imputing from the groups, but I must not really understand exactly what's at stake. Like what ideally do you want? What's an unfair, what's a fair algorithm doing? Yeah. I think in a, in a sense, I think what, what you're asking is like the sort of foundational challenge in all of, in all of algorithmic, this work people call algorithmic fairness, algorithmic bias, which is, you know, when we, when we write down uh, a supervised learning problem, we have to we specify an object we specify an objective function, we specify what data we're going to use. Yeah. Talking about fairness is effectively talking about what's the choice of that objective function in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, we are we simply adopting some like utilitarian criterion where we're just going to try to minimize average loss in the population. Yeah. You know? want to make the fewest false positives, the fewest false negatives. Mm -hmm. But the distribution of true positives and false positives and uh, true negatives may be different across groups. So yeah. therefore, if minimizing the average, you may be doing things slightly differently oh. versus a minority group. Huh. Is that what you really wanted to do in the first place? Right. Um, and I think the reason this becomes so salient is you know as prediction tools drift into really high stakes settings mm. sort of simple choices of that objective function really have enormous consequences you know if you think in a hiring situation a fault a false negative is you did not hire someone who would have actually been a really productive worker yep uh, and if that happens differently across uh, racial groups, different mm -hmm. genders, other legally protected care, other protected characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, this starts to be, this is enormously consequential. Mm -hmm. And the second bit is like, well, once you enter this game of trying to write down a formal definition of what it means to be fair or not, yeah. there are many different ways you could try to write that down. 
I mean, yeah. you know, the law world of law has notions of disparate treatment, treating equally equal people differently in some sense, disparate impact. You know, we don't want too large of differences in choices across groups. Um, so even within law, you have, you know, many different definitions that yeah. could be operationalized. Right. Uh, and then once you start getting into uh, all the different objective functions people write down in machine learning, you can incorporate fairness twists on all of them. So these off the shelf machine learning models are potentially a problem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this disparate treatment because they're not really fine tuned for a specific as well, they, a person might not even necessarily know. Well, I guess practitioners do know, but there might be some people that could not articulate what exactly the objective function might even be. Yeah. And so I think, I think if like the sort of core question that's animated a lot of work in fairness is how do we define what that means formally mm -hmm. so that we can then try to optimize in some way. Yeah. I think what that often surfaces is, ex is exactly the question you raise, which is oftentimes we don't agree on what right. fair take. What if what is a fair hiring process look like? What does a fair college admissions process look like? Mm. Sort of what machine learning starts at is you've specified the problem. Now I know how to solve it in some sense, given some yeah. data. Yeah. This is a question of how do you even specify the problem in the first place? Right, right. So are a lot of your peers, are they starting to, are they just as conversant in machine learning when you get there as, as you seem to be emerging? I mean, is it pretty much ubiquitous across your cohort that uh, machine learning, or are you noticing that you're sort of moving into the edges of it a little bit more? Yeah, I think, I think when, when I started, uh, it wasn't very common, certainly among in my cohort. Um, and I think over time, I would say I've seen in the last, yeah, I guess I've now been seven years ago is when I started my PhD, yeah. which right. makes me feel older than I, I actually am. Um, but I think it like since then, I think like each cohort coming in yeah. comes in with like far more, far more knowledge about it, you know? Mm -hmm. I remember like, you know, but starting in my third year, all people who are in the incoming cohort maybe did an RA were like, oh yeah, I implemented XYZ, causal forest, lasso. Whereas when I started, um, I was, I was in the, yeah, I was sort of in the tail in the sense that I was thinking about these questions. Whereas I think by the time I was graduating, it became much more, much more common. Yeah. Well, so, but you also end up, okay. So, so who do you, do you end up working primarily with, with Sindel Mullenthan as your advisor? Yeah. So he, um, so he left Harvard, uh, at the end of my first year. Oh, okay. And I, so I stayed in touch with him. Um, but, and wrote one more paper with him during my PhD, but that was, that was good. We kind of, I mean, just by function of being in different places. Um, so during my PhD, I'd say, Sort of the main people um, I spoke with the most were sort of uh, Gary Chamberlain, um, but he he unfortunately passed away during my third year, mm. uh, and I spent a lot of time talking to Neil Shepard. Um, so kind of from from Mark Watson at Princeton, I'd always had this interest in time series, yeah, and just sort of noticed in my first year that when time series people talk about causal effects. They use very different language than, you know, the potential outcome framework that yep. used to. Um, and sort of Neil Shepard was was interested in, in um, similar questions uh, at the time. So he became one of my one of my main advisors. And then starting in my, I believe it was the end of my second year, beginning of my third year, um, Isaiah Andrews joined the faculty at Harvard. Um, oh, is he, it, he's your main advisor? Yeah. So then sort of by the end of my PhD, I was mostly talking to Isaiah. Uh, okay. So what do you end up having as your job market paper? Yeah. So, um, so my job market paper, uh, was about, uh, actually very, very related to these, um, motivated by a lot of these machine learning questions we're talking about. Um, and for the starting point is across 
a wide variety of high stakes settings, whether that's pretrial release, hiring, mm. uh, medical diagnosis and treatment, um, sort of a main policy tool people want to introduce is they want to, you know, give a judge an algorithm and assess. Yeah. Can we provide them with some sort of prediction um, in order to improve their decisions? Right. Uh, and a lot sort of hangs on improve their decisions, which implies they're making some, they're making a mistake in some yeah. sense. They're mispredicting some measure of risk based on the information that we could instead give to a supervised learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my job market paper, I tried to try to think about that question um, a little more rigorously and ask, you know, given the data we observe uh, in these sorts of high stake settings on uh, choices by decision makers, some measure of an outcome and some characteristics of cases like defendants or job applications, can we identify whether these decision makers are making prediction mistakes? They're yeah. misforecasting risk based on information that we could have instead given to a machine learning algorithm. Oh, 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 oh. So how, what's the setup? What's the, you're, you're, you have, I, mean, I think I know the paper, but yeah. can you, for the sake of the listener, uh, what's the, the general institutional setup of the paper? Yeah. So the, the sort of general setup is uh, sort of, we imagine that we have uh, a decision maker, say a judge, yeah. you know, make choices whether to release or detain the defendants, a um, mm -hmm. large number of defendants. Um, and for each of those defendants, we get to see, you know, a potentially really large set of characteristics, some mm -hmm. demographic information, their current charge, their prior arrest record. Mm -hmm. um, and if the judge decides to release this defendant, we also get to see whether they go on to commit some form of pretrial misconduct. So there's sort mm -hmm. of this one-sided missing data, selective labels problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, given uh, that data we get to see, you know, we would like to model the judge as they see the X's about defendants, they form some initial beliefs, Perhaps they additionally get to see some private information that we don't get to see because they you know, interact with defendants in the courtroom. And then based on the observed X's and their private information, they're going to form beliefs to maximize their own expected utility. Mm. Uh, so the question I want to ask, the question I ask in the paper is, does that model, if you place really no assumptions on private information, generate testable implications in their oh. choices? Okay. Uh, and it turns out under, under some assumptions, yeah, I think reasonable assumptions, uh, the answer is yes. Um, yeah. And so then that's sort of the, the econometrics part of the paper is, is formalizing that identification question and results. Mm. Um, and then I take that data, uh, take that results um, and use it to analyze the pretrial system in New York and ask oh. how many judges are making these prediction mistakes if they are. Yeah. What sort of cases are they making prediction mistakes on? Um, and does our understanding of prediction mistakes uh, help us understand when a pretrial release algorithm may be useful and helpful? Oh, how, how bad is it? Um, so it's pretty, it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty, it's uh, not, not great. Not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're like very conservative and favorable to the judge, it looks like at least uh, at least twenty percent of all judges in New York make these prediction mistakes. And what are they, they predicting? They're predicting reoffending. Yeah, they're pretty. So th this is where there's you know part of the the gory details in this pretrial setting is um, at least in New York, uh, judges have a very well defined uh, legal objective what they're supposed to care about. Um, mm. They're really supposed to base this decision on whether someone would fail to appear in court on their date or not. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. So, Showing up at court. Do they, will they actually show right. up? This is pretrial detention. Got it. Yeah. Um, and then you can always, you can, uh, you know, do robustness checks to say, well, suppose the judge cares about both failure to appear risk, but also being rearrested mm -hmm. or failure to appear risk and being rearrested for a violent crime. Mm -hmm. So you can, do very, you can basically rerun the identification analysis for sort of richer definitions of, of the outcome they care about and are predicting. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but sort of under the most conservative set of assumptions, meaning most favorable to the judge, uh, to judges, um, it looks like at least 20% of judges in New York do make these mistakes. It's quite a large number. Yep. They have like 
I think it's like 30 to 40% of all defendants. And it varies by group. Um, it, it sounds like it's going to be unfair too, right? Yeah. And it varies across groups. So you tend yeah. to see, you tend to see more prediction mistakes um, on minority defendants as well. Right. Right. So with your algorithmic approach, how do you know if it's a mistake? You don't observe the counterfactual for any of these guys. So how do you know when you predict that they would have shown up had that judge not, you know, taken an action against them? It seems like it's such a messy, complex problem that you're sort of stuck in to try to even see if there's any errors, right? Am I thinking of it right? Yeah, no, that, that's, exa that's exactly right. Um, sort of a slightly different way to to say the problem you're, you're pointing out is we, we again have, you know, the fundamental problem of causal inference. We don't know what would have happened in the counterfactual. Mm -hmm. We don't get to see whether a detained defendant would have actually failed to appear in court. Yeah. Um, and so part of the work in the paper is to show sort of, sort of first that if we have uh, any sort of instrument that affects the decision, but is unrelated to risk, yeah. which in a lot of these settings happens from the sort of quasi random assignment of decision makers to cases, um, even without resorting to assumptions like monotonicity, you can bound what is risk among the detained in this example. So you can sort of mm. bound what that counterfactual would look, can look like. Mm. Um, and then it turns out that bound is sufficient to test for prediction mistakes. Mm. Ask, can you find a release defendant who is more risky than the best case counterfactual for a detained defendant? Mm. And if that's true, this judge should be able to swap their choices on this pair of defendants and do strictly better, assuming that they're actually trying to maximize or they're actually caring about failure to appear risk in this example. Mm. Have you guys ever tried to present this to outside of academia to people like this? And if so, what, what's your sense of the obstacles out in the real world to this kind? I mean, in criminal justice, they're so open to the, the algorithms and have been for decades. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a great question. Um, so I think, I think I would, I would identify at least two big challenges um that i see so one one is um you know on the one hand sort of this evidence suggests that a lot of judges make sizable mistakes they really matter mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that's that's often very surprising it's true in this pre-trial setting and it's often true in many high stakes settings as well is that decision makers actually get very little feedback about their choices mm -hmm. basically if a judge releases a defendant they never actually know that that person failed to yeah. appear in court unless they're rearrested and they show up back in their court. Totally. Is that just because of the decentralized nature of the criminal? It's like, you know, one hand doesn't really talk to the other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, in a sense, if I show up on the bench and I never get feedback, how am I supposed to learn over yep. time? That I yeah. Totally. Totally. And so there's this. That might reinforce some of the, the, the judge fixed effects principles, which is just kind of, I'm just going to keep doing what has, I've been doing, exactly. which, might be, which might lead to some sort of habit or bias or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. right. And um, so there's like there's an institutional question: How do we? Why doesn't that feedback exist? And how might we design it? Yeah, uh, if we could. Um, and then the second is I think where I started is you know the response to this work has been well we should we should incorporate algorithms into decision making. Yeah. Uh, but oftentimes the way this gets introduced is it's uh, we're just going to give a judge a recommendation, maybe some risk score, and then they'll have to look at that recommendation and risk score and then make their own decision. Or we're going to give a doctor a risk score and a recommendation or a guideline, and then they'll still have to make the decision themselves. Yeah. Uh, and sort of the hope, I think the reasonable hope is, well, if judges see some extra information that's not available to the risk score, yeah. ideally, if they're rational, they would combine these two information sources mm -hmm. and make a better decision. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what we've often seen in practice is uh, the, the effects of giving people algorithms are either there is no effect, people don't really pay attention to them, 
Oh. or they uh, lead to sort of surprising changes in behavior. So someone um, who I overlapped with briefly at Harvard, Alex Albright, has some like really wonderful work showing that um, basically when Kentucky rolled out a risk score and recommendation tool, um, it had some sort of surprising effects on disparities and pretrial release decisions between mm. black and white. Um, mm. And so it's a long way of saying, I think now like what's what excites me econometrically is this sort of screams out that, you know, we started from let's test if decision makers are rational, if they have correct beliefs, they don't. Mm -hmm. So they're really behavioral, they're making mistakes in some way, but we're presenting, you know, them with supervised learning algorithms that are just statistical objects that are not designed with them in mind. Mm. So how do we design algorithms in response to behavioral biases and mistakes that that we can identify in data? I think that's really wide open, fertile ground. Um, and what excites me about it is, I think coming back to, you know, we we're talking about why I ended up in economics. It's like yeah. a a route to how we can have impact in the world as I was just thinking it's just that it's kind of you know you really haven't left that core interest that you had in policy questions yeah from a, from a distance you know people don't really associate that with machine learning they do associate that with causal inference but yeah. you know it, it's funny that uh, until now I hadn't really seen that quite that connection uh, that that your your driving interest has 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 continued to be about public policy, sort of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, yeah. Now, now, now that I get to be, you know, an assistant professor, I get to stand on my soapbox every now yeah, and then. Sure, <laughs> sure. Students, and I think I I guess I firmly believe, you know, we're we are in the field of economics. We do econometrics because we care about the intersection of statistics and economics. Yeah. And I think what makes economics amazing is it's like, it is a social science that cares about impact in the world. We can argue right. about whether it's positive impact or negative impact, right. but we as a field value people who make uh, contributions to how we as a society think about important policy questions. Yeah, yeah. And econometrics is beautiful because we can provide the tools to help people answer those questions, whether yeah. that's in causal inference, whether that's building new um, machinery in the world of, of machine learning. Yeah. Um, we have, we can therefore play like a huge role. In right. Right. Well, I want to talk about one more paper and then I'm gonna, I feel like I've, I've, I'm going to have, I'm obligated to, to let you get back to your, your job. But um this paper that you wrote with John Roth on parallel trends, credible approach to parallel trends. I, I was wondering if you could just for the sake of the, the listener sort of say, you know, what is that paper about and why is that paper kind of that? What, what is the value of that paper, you know, for, for practitioners that do difference and differences? Yeah. Um, so I think, so what, what we're trying to do in that paper is, uh, you know, when researchers, we, we care about, we care about important policy changes, but we can't, we can't randomize everything. Right. Uh, and so we, we, res we often resort because there's just no better option. Um, when we have staggered variation, we have, uh, some states adopt a policy, but some don't, um, how can we measure the causal effect of that policy? Um, and so then the standard way we analyze that data is through a difference in differences or an event study design. Yep. Uh, but that design rests on the parallel trends assumption, um, in the simplest form, the sort of control potential outcomes would have evolved similarly and treated in control states. Uh, and if we believe that assumption, we can learn the average treatment effect on the treated, everything is great. But I think if you inject truth serum into anyone, no one really believes that that thing holds exactly. Right. Uh, and so what we try to do in this paper is to uh, give applied researchers uh, a framework for thinking yeah. about how they can measure the robustness of their difference in differences or event study design to yeah. the parallel trends assumption mm -hmm. uh, or how sensitive would our policy conclusions be if that assumption were violated. Yeah. Uh, 
So hopefully what the, what the paper does is it allows uh, researchers to sort of more clearly explore the mapping between, you know, intuitive violations of parallel trends that we often talk about in seminars mm -hmm. to the formal statements that we make. Um, and the intuitive but, violations are coming off of the event study, right? They're coming off exactly. of the pre-trends? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we see variation in the pre-trends. Perhaps things look like they're trending in a particular direction over time. Mm -hmm. We see large differences between treated and control units in the pre-trends. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we look at those event study plots, we're forming, I think, subjective judgments on what would yeah. likely happen post period. Yeah, uh, and so what we do in the paper is try to write down an econometric framework to formalize those sorts of subjective, uh, you know hand extrapolations that we're doing right uh, right right so let's say there's somebody out there uh writing a paper you know do they have their event study and you know they're like i really wish i could show this to ashesh what what is it you're going to be looking at in that event study that might make you go i think you're fine and then another thing you're going to be looking at you're going to say i think maybe this new paper about me and john roth would be worth doing like what do you, what exactly are the pieces of information that you're wanting that them to be paying attention to yeah that's a great question um so i think off i think like a good and honestly it's it's how it's how the paper it's how the paper started with uh with me and john was just you know taking taking the event study plot and sort of one one benchmark case we think about is suppose there were like a linear violation of parallel trends or some mm. relaxation of linear violations of parallel trends. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I remember early on in the paper, John and I, we would look at event studies and try to just like stick our pen at the confidence interval and see like what sort of lines could you draw yep. through. Um, and I think if you do that on an event study and you see like you could draw many different lines through the pre-period uh, confidence mm. intervals, um, I think you should then want to think very carefully about what what is the parallel what is the content of the parallel trends assumption yep. should we be violations and then you know use use our methods uh to try to think about um reporting robust confidence intervals um and i think in a similar sense if you see in your pre-periods you know everything looks good but there's you know maybe perhaps one period or two periods where there is a large difference yep. but on average things look close to zero in the pre-period, that might be another suggestion that there are some time varying shock that leads to differences between treated and control units. Um, a different set of, uh, of relaxations we consider sort of formalize, um, formalize that idea. You think you would literally recommend to somebody uh, get out a ruler and draw a straight line through the confidence intervals. And, and uh, if you can do that and it, it not be on the post treatment like a parallel trend use my method to bound it i think i i think so my form my formal recommendation would be uh to you know start with our methods set the two set the parameter m is zero and then start with oh line. yeah um but i think i think oftentimes that's like a pretty good it's a pretty good like just rule of thumb check mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um just m of happen. zero, m of zero being the code. Yeah. Set the m of zero, meaning no parallel trends violation, and then just gradually increase it. Yeah. So m, and I guess in depending on the choice of uh, there are these like sets capital delta. Um, so for the one that associates associated with um, relaxations of linear trends, m is zero is allowing for a linear trend. Yeah. Or, any sort of worst case linear extrapolation. Yeah. So I start there, that's sort of formalizing the intuitive line checking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then as you allow M to be larger, you're allowing for more nonlinear extrapolations. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Um, well, let me let me end with this. So, you know, this this is not asking you to be like, well, I've I've done a year as a as a professor so i know everything i'm not i'm not asking it like that i'm saying more like if you could imagine being in a room with a bunch of a, new assistant professors all over the country right 
they're starting out this year. What, what would you say like the most valuable thing it is that you've learned this last year with, you know, one year under your belt, like about your own, how you're going to try to drive this train to tenure. It's like, what, what is it that you think you learned in this last year that, you know, you would say to a bunch of people, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I don't, I guess, I don't know. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it drives the train to tenure, but, uh, I was, is actually having dinner with one of my friends here last night. And we were, we were just talking about it is it's one thing that is amazing about, about being an academic is how little structured feedback you get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, that structured feedback is negative. Yeah. Most of the time you submit a paper, it's going to get rejected. Right. When people, when you give a seminar, people are far more likely to ask you a hard question than give you a compliment. And I found it, we were, we were, we were talking about how it's very easy to just get, you know, really down in the dumps. If the only thing you're hearing is negative feedback um, and sort of an internal, an internal goal I've had for myself is to, you know, when someone's giving a seminar and I really enjoy it, you know, actually tell that person right. really enjoy the, talk, the paper. I found the paper insightful starting, you know, in referee reports, if I liked a part of the paper, actually saying I like this part of the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, like I found that when people have done that for me, it really sticks with me. Yeah. And if I would like the profession to be more like that, you know, I can control my own behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I think, I think as a community, I, like, you know, I think a lot of economics is really wonderful and very friendly. And I think we can like continue, continue doing that for each other and mm. really trying to send positive, positive vibes out into the world and hopefully yeah. more happy and productive. Well, I, I wonder if you're, I wonder if you drew uh, a lucky card with that cohort at Harvard that was super friendly. Yeah. And yeah I, think you know? I, I think I did. I think in, you know, whenever I hear the horror stories, I mean, I think I was, I was really lucky that. Cause uh, you probably were getting that a little bit more often, yeah. right? I mean, you were yeah. probably hearing it from one another and you said it wasn't as, I mean, maybe some, I'm not positive, but maybe, maybe some of that negativity is, uh, it definitely isn't helped by the competitive environment yeah yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely right. I, I think i've been i've been really lucky to in really enjoy my time as an economist who knows how long it will last but yeah i think like that shouldn't be the exception I think. right and we have a lot of control and especially now that you're an assistant professor like it's a very big change that you're now actually an authority figure mm. for so many young people yeah and will be looking at you, how you behave in seminars, how you behave in the classroom, how you behave in meetings. Yep. And you can't be complaining about unfriendliness in the profession if you yourself are also unfriendly to like the people around you. Totally, totally, totally. That's a great way to, that's a great thing. Well, good luck on all this very cool work. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, the the predictive algorithmic work um, but that's, that's super, you know, in some ways, I mean, I'm just kind of rambling here for a second, but, but, you know, in some ways we think of causal inference as like the most directly policy relevant, but that's some, that's a bit of a fantasy in a way, because you're kind of hoping somebody's going to read your minimum wage paper and then like a legislator is going to do something, mm -hmm. which, but the algorithmic work like gets brought in to agencies and is then used. Yeah. You know, so it is kind of, it is kind of wild that, I mean, you're doing both. You're like, you're directly in the full machinery of influencing policy by doing so much, so much fundamental work on causal inference and in this predictive algorithm. But it is, it is kind of interesting to think that, the creating of these algorithms actually might have direct immediate consequences for people's lives, which is what you were saying. It had always been sort of your something that really drove you. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, yeah, one short story is I did some work when I was a PhD student and still, and still talking with them about at this large investment bank in Australia. Yeah. And it was just talking with them about uh, work on academic work on algorithmic fairness, how we can improve supervised learning. And it was, it's the sort of thing where there was, there was no causal question. All they were right. interested in, how do we predict yeah. uh, which applications they should fund or not. Yeah. But clearly small changes in what that algorithm looks like, if they're processing hundreds of thousands of applications a year, small changes in a percentage sense are huge absolute changes in the allocation of credit. If you think about this in labor markets, who gets a job? If you're thinking about in this criminal justice system, who gets jailed versus released? Yep. So the, the scope for impact, I think, is really is really large. And as I say, I think that's what makes economics amazing. We're, we're a field driven by impact in the world. Yeah. And we tools available to, to think about it. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, it's very cool to have you in the profession. It's really nice today to to meet, and I hope we get to talk again. Yeah, uh, absolutely. In in, uh, in real life or something. Yeah, absolutely. This was really fun, Scott. Okay. All right. I'll see you later, man. See ya.